What are you into, hmm? I've always liked rainbows. We don't like your kind around here. Rocco's Modern Life debuted on Nickelodeon in September of 1993. Created by Joe Murray, a cartoonist who didn't even want to make a TV show, Rocco was part of an unlikely revolution in TV animation, along with Ren and Stimpy, Rugrats, and Doug, a new wave of cartoons that rejected the tarted up toy commercials of the 1980s. Come in, you royal boob. By embracing the eccentric and sometimes shocking visions of their creators. Spin around and shake that booty. Like this? Beautiful. At first glance, Rocco's Modern Life looks like a sweet kids show. A plucky little wallaby and his quirky friends get into comic mischief around their surreal suburb, but in an effort to reflect, well, modern life, the show is loaded with adult humor and double entendres you may never have noticed. Oh baby, oh baby, oh baby. But as bold as Rocco was, there were still some topics that were too hot to approach directly, and others that would take decades to come home to O-Town. I'm not Ralph anymore. I'm Rachel. Wow, cool! That is awesome! Hey friends, I'm Matt Baum, I make videos about pop culture, and today I want to show you how Rocco's modern life might have managed to explore queer themes in TV animation long before the lesbian space rocks and gay rat husbands that we enjoy today. Are you having cake? Upholding a long, proud tradition of subversive humor in cartoons. I'd like to see something nice in a pair of bedroom slippers. Confidentially, so would I. And by the way, if you want to watch any of the cartoons featured in this video, I've got links in the description and a link to my Patreon, where I'll be posting even more about the history of animation, Nickelodeon shows, and censored cartoons of the 90s. So, if you were of a certain age in the 1990s, Nickelodeon dominated original animated shows. It started with Rugrats and Doug and Ren and Stimpy in 1991. Rocco's Modern Life followed in 93. The show was created by Joe Murray, who said at the time that he hated TV animation. So of course, Nickelodeon gave him a show to see what he'd do. What he did was create a satire of modern life, with Rocco wandering into awkward social situations full of zany and often very gross visual gags. Watching it now, you can clearly see how a lot of the folks who made Rocco would go on to create Spongebob in 1999. But for now, let's focus on a 96 episode of Rocco entitled Closet Clown, which is supposedly about clowns. But if you know where to look, there are hints of a deeper meaning littered throughout. The episode starts with a clown and a duck driving through the suburbs, as they so often do. They get a flat while inside a nearby house, Rocco's neighbor Mrs. Bighead is on the phone with, well, Someone. You too, Sissy. <laughs> this sense of love. You don't have a sister. Well, that's peculiar. So, here we have a character who sounds like Harvey Firestein talking to someone called Sissy, which, to be honest, sounds like a lot of brunches that I've been to. Anyway, outside the house, the clown's trying to fix the tire, but he just inflates Duck, making him big and round. Ed hears the commotion and rushes outside, upset. Very upset. We don't like your kind around here. Take your freakish Tycho back to Scandinavia. Wait, what? Scandinavia? Why there? Well, in 1996, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden were known for being the first countries in the world to offer recognition to same-sex couples. Scandinavia had a reputation as a haven for queer people. Denmark decriminalized homosexuality way back in 1933, more than 70 years before the U.S. It was the site of some of the earliest gender confirmation surgeries, though they certainly weren't called that at the time, and relationship recognition came to those countries in the late 80s and early 90s. Not everyone watching Rocco's Modern Life would have known that, kids almost certainly wouldn't, but if you did know, hearing Ed tell someone that their kind should go back to Scandinavia would make you prick up your ears. And sure enough, the clown and the duck escape back to Oslo. Bon voyage. I've been doing fjords all my life. But they leave something behind, their truck, and a nose. Ed finds it the next morning, and something about it speaks to him. He's curious. He likes it but he's also embarrassed when he's almost caught with it. He's internalized some kind of clown-related stigma, which 
Fair enough, it can be a little uncomfortable to see a clown where it's not expected. Honestly, I find Ed's nervousness here deeply relatable. His fear of being caught with a clown nose is me, nearly getting caught reading XY Magazine in a Walden Books in 1996. I used to hide gay magazines inside of newspapers so nobody would know what I was reading. And a quick side note, you see the way Ed's hiding the nose behind his butt? I don't know why I'm telling you this, but many years ago, my partner was talking in his sleep and he said to me, so, do you have a clown nose on your butt now? Which made me irrationally angry. I can only assume that when he dreams of me, this is what he sees. Anyway, later at work, Ed can't get the nose off his mind. He runs to the bathroom to engage in a little cheeky washroom clowning and is having a fine time until, like George Michael, he's caught. Big Ed, I'd like to see you in my office, please. Now, I want to point out that the story so far seems to be about clowns. But if you've been paying attention, you might notice that the animators seem to be dropping little hints that it's really about something else. The word closet in the title, sissy, Scandinavia, the feeling of discovering something thrilling about yourself, and then the shame of keeping it a secret. Sure, maybe none of these things mean much by themselves, but when they're combined, they fit together into a pattern that seems to point toward a big gay metaphor. But was that really the creator's intent or am I just reading too much into it? Could be that I'm projecting. After all, commenters often let me know that TV shows don't actually mean anything. Nothing means nothing. Nothing means nothing. What do you mean by that? Maybe I'm just seeing what I want to see. But we're going to come back to that. First, look at what happens to Mr. Big Head once he's caught clowning. He arrives at his boss's office where there's a surprise waiting for him. Funny feeling about you, Big Ed. The boss is also a clown. See, when you do clownery, the clown comes back to bite. This is a big moment for Mr. Big Head, and once again, I can relate. His secret is out. He's been exposed. He's panicking. Don't tell me you haven't gone public yet. Public? You must be joking. Do I look like I'm joking to you? Also, Big Head's learned that someone he knows shares a similar secret. His boss is super enthusiastic, totally comfortable being open as a clown, quite a change from his public persona. Plus, he seems to be connected to a whole clown community that Mr. Big Head didn't know existed. Hello, Chuckles Doodoo -doo here. Say, I've got a new one who... <laughs> the boss insists that Big Head take the next step and start clowning in public. Big Head's nervous. I'm not ready! But he gives it a shot, showing up to perform at a birthday party. Where's the clown? There's supposed to be a clown! Oh, don't worry. They're here. Ed apparently has a knack for clowning. He's a huge hit. Thank goodness for clowns like you. His career starts taking off. He's clowning all over town. It feels amazing. He's having the time of his life. But he's also keeping this a secret from friends and family, including his wife. No secrets between sailors. Of course, it's only a matter of time before Ed's found out. And sure enough, the fateful day comes when he shows up at a party and sees all of his friends in attendance and his wife. Now. Once again, being found out unexpectedly like this is deeply relatable to me. In 1996, I went to a conference for queer youth called, and this was the real name, Children from the Shadows. I don't know why they called it that. It sounds like a conference for young vampires. Anyway, while I was there, doing my best to flirt with a boy that I liked, my heart nearly stopped when I saw my parents across the room. They'd apparently decided to come to learn how to be more supportive, which was actually an extremely wonderful thing for them to do. But it sure was a surprise. As it turns out, the people in Ed's life are supportive too. His wife still loves him, his friends understand. Everyone has secrets. That's what makes us special. Sometimes I like to pretend I'm a pixie. I'm wearing European style undergarments. There, you see? And well, I've always liked rainbows. Oh no, not rainbows. Apparently, that's one step over the line because everyone is disgusted by Rocco's admission and they chase him out of town. The end! But not really the end, because even though Rocco's Modern Life went off the air later that year, it came back for a Netflix special in 2019 to find out that life has become even more modern, in ways both good and bad. And we'll get to that in just a bit. But first, the question remains, is this 1996 episode, Closet Clown, meant to be read as a metaphor for being gay? Or is it just about clowns? Well, before we answer that question, let's take a look at what came next. 
Rocco gets launched into space in the series finale in late 96, as one does, and then comes back for a Netflix special in 2019. During that time he was away, American animation continued to evolve, like a diglet. For one thing, cartoons started aging up. There were new shows meant for teens like Daria and Mission Hill, shows meant for adults like King of the Hill, shows for both like South Park, and shows for no one like Duckman. What the hell are you staring at? All of those came within a year or two of Rocco's modern life. All of them were targeted to older audiences, and all of them included queer characters. Some of this newfound representation was good, and some of it was, well, here's a 98 episode of Cow and Chicken, which features a women's motorcycle gang called the Buffalo Gals. <laughs> Later on, the episode shows them playing a rousing game of softball before a cow beats them all up. It's not great. For a more pleasant depiction of a ladies' sports team, consult your local Steven Universe. Hey, Ruby. <laughs> what are they doing? Flirting. Throughout the 2000s, creators of 90s cartoons began talking openly about the queer themes and characters that they considered part of the shows when they first aired, even if it wasn't explicit at the time. Greg Weissman, who created Gargoyle, said that Lexington was gay, but that if he'd put that on the show, he probably would have been fired. Greg also revealed that Lexington had a crush on Stagheart, which I saw him first. Hey Arnold's creator revealed that Mr. Simmons was gay, the producer of Mystery Incorporated revealed that Velma was a lesbian. Is there something going on between you and Shaggy? No. Arthur gave Mr. Ratburn a wedding, Patty came out on The Simpsons, Steven Universe even featured a same-sex wedding. And yes, it's complicated because they're aliens and those bodies are technically projections from their gems, but come on, I think it counts. And that brings us to Static Kling. It's 2019 and Rocco's back from outer space. He's surrounded by changes and one of the biggest of all is with an old friend. On the original run of Rocco's Modern Life, the gang meets the Big Head's kid, voiced by Joe Murray, who makes Rocco's favorite show, a cartoon called The Fat Heads. Mr. Big Head is ashamed to have an animator in the family and at one point declares, I have no done. Funny thing about that, turns out he was right. In Static Kling, Rocco goes looking for his old friend and learns... I'm not Ralph anymore. I'm Rachel. And just like that, everyone's fine with it. Wow, cool! That is awesome! The gang's reaction is surprisingly Klingon. Kazan, my beloved old friend. I'm Jadzia now. Oh, uh, well, Jadzia, my beloved old friend. But not everyone's so accepting at first. Mr. Bighead seems to have forgotten how kind everyone was to him when he came out as a clown. I'm not your son, I'm your daughter. And I'm finally happy. I have no daughter! And even though Rocco accepts Rachel, he's upset to discover that she's changed his favorite show, The Fatheads, by introducing new characters. You! You changed it, Rachel! You changed The Fatheads! It's too much change! This gets to the heart of what Static Kling is about. Change, or at least being afraid of change. Ed stuck in the past, doesn't like that Rachel isn't the person he thought he knew. Rocco's stuck in the past too, wants everything to go back to the way it was in the 90s. But he's talked out of that by, of all characters, Mr. Bighead. One of the changes that Rachel made to the Fatheads is a tribute to her loving parents. Mr. Bighead realizes that as difficult as change is, he'd rather accept it than live without his daughter. Rocco, we can live in the past. We can be grateful for it, but life isn't permanent. And if we don't embrace what's now, we miss out on a lot of the important stuff. And with that, Rocco suddenly sees that change can be good. Rachel owes her happiness to change. In fact, the character Rachel exists because of all that change in the animation industry. When Static Kling came out, Joe Murray revealed that he worked with Glad to develop the storyline, focusing on Rachel as a main character and her transition as a key element of the script. That would have been unthinkable 20 years earlier, when anything remotely queer had to be hidden or censored in animation. And Joe revealed something else as well. For the first time, he talked about just what they were up to with that Closet Clown episode. So we finally have an answer about whether it's supposed to be a big gay metaphor, or if I've just been reading into it too much this whole time. And the answer is, quote, It was intentional. Members of the staff, some of whom were openly gay, decided to make the episode a metaphor for being in the closet. In other words, Rocco's modern life has been waiting 20 years to be able to tell queer stories, and now they finally can. It's perfect that Static Kling is a story about accepting change, because change is what made it possible to tell that story. Turns out, 
modern life isn't all that bad. By the way, as part of making this video, I gathered a ton of stories about the history of animation and the development of Nicktoons that just didn't fit into this script. But if you're interested in stuff like the golden age of cartoons, the impact of anime, and the huge gamble that Nickelodeon took on shows like Rocco, I'm going to be posting additional videos over on Patreon. Check all that out at patreon.com slash mattbaum and subscribe to my little newsletter at mattbaum.com for a little sneak peek at what I'm working on next. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll take the physical challenge. Find the flag, find the flag, it's in there somewhere. <laughs>